The specificity of this panel is that each of the speakers has a topic of uh, their own, so they don't just uh, uh, debate the uh, general uh, topic of um, uh, this uh, panel, the future of liberal global order Central European perspectives. So each of them will speak on some uh, particular aspect of this, uh, of this general topic, and that means you have to uh, concentrate on each of, um, uh, the, uh, 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 of the speeches uh, to uh, ask questions probably to one particular participant when, when, uh, when we get to the question and answer uh, period. Uh, and now we get to the first uh, uh, speaker who is uh, uh, Joseph Batura. Uh, Associate Professor of Political Science at Comenius University Bratislava, uh, who has a presentation on three types of value-based foreign policy. So, value-based foreign policy, please. Okay, thanks, uh, Sergey. It's a pleasure to be back in Prague once again uh, at a conference organized by the Institute of International Relations. Uh, that's a wonderful opportunity, as I have been involved in working with the Institute for a number of years as a member of its board. Um, they do indeed have someone from outside on the board, which is nice. Um, the, I understand I only have 10 minutes, so uh, I will try to make this brief and as concise as possible. The title of my presentation is uh, uh, Three Types of Value-Based Foreign Policy. Um, and I will basically argue that um, in uh, current development, we need to rethink the notion or the concept of value-based foreign policy. Uh, in the 1990s and before the entry into NATO and the EU, uh, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, uh, it has become very popular uh, with our governments in Slovakia and the Czech Republic, Poland, uh, to argue that we do need to have a value-based foreign policy. Now, before the entry into the EU and NATO, uh, that, was the, that was equal with trying to enter into the EU and NATO. That was the values that we were working with, working for. Um, after the entry into the EU and NATO, that is in 2004, uh, there is much less consensus on what we actually mean when we say that we have value-based foreign policy. And yet, it is becoming increasingly important to define that and have an understanding of what it actually means. Uh, because we do, that is a source. If we conduct foreign policy in a value base, based on values, that may be a source of major conflicts, as we have seen and we keep on seeing in the EU's neighborhood. I will argue that there are three types of value-based foreign policy. Uh, one is value-based foreign policy of conviction. Number two, value-based foreign policy of understanding. And number three, value-based foreign policy of consciousness. Um, the first notion uh, relates to the fact that uh, uh, liberal democracy and liberal democracies as the value foundation of uh, our foreign policy, uh, they have been a Eurocentric and uh, transatlantic based on Eurocentric and transatlantic experiences. Um, if you look at the emergence of liberal democracies, they are indeed, and their engagement with the world, they are indeed uh, working based on the experiences and traditions of the European countries and the way they have been engaging with the world. So Great Britain, when it was opening up China to uh, liberal trade in the 1860s, was indeed promoting liberal democracy and the values of liberal democracies. But also Woodrow Wilson uh, was promoting liberal democracy uh, as a set of principles and values teaching democracy to the rest of the world. Uh, <coughs> European, more modern and more recent traditions in promoting democracy uh, as a value, as a set of values, uh, are also related to the notion of um, normative power Europe. So these ideas of Europe being a civilian power, transforming its neighborhood and other countries by law and by rules, uh, by norms, by normative pressures, that's part of this. Um, so the basic idea and the basic ontology of the world when we think about um, value-based foreign policy as a foreign policy of consciousness is that there is one world uh, of liberal democracies and then there are other countries. Uh, it is us 
and then there are them who are not liberal democracies. And the vocation of us who are liberal democracies is that we're trying to transform uh, those who are not liberal democracies. The way we do this uh, basically is a sort of a macro level approach where we try to install democracy uh, in countries who are non-democratic, install democratic institutions, and eventually we expect that to generate democratic processes later on. An alternative vision of value-based foreign policy would be the second one, and that is the value-based foreign policy of understanding. That is based ontologically on the notion that there are multiple civilizations, multiple sets of value systems around the world, which coexist in a world where you cannot normatively tell which of them is actually better. And liberal democracies are one of these value-based well, value systems. Um, authors such as uh, Chantal Mouffe and others would be talking about this universalist sort of uh, world in which there is a basic foundation of universal values, but then of course you have these other cultures and these other civilizations, these other value systems who may, not, may or may, or not, may not embrace the same kinds of values like liberal democracies. Um, there are alternative value systems such as the Asian way, as you know, um, something developed in Southeastern Asia, uh, countries such as Singapore and others would be uh, promoters of this idea. This would be focusing on the idea of uh, working hard, uh, cherishing collective interests, but not necessarily promoting liberal democratic values. Um, in practice, this kind of a uh, value-based foreign policy of understanding would embrace the idea that we should understand and get to know these other cultures and understand their developmental patterns, but we shouldn't necessarily be trying to change their way. Um, in practical terms, as to what exactly this means for the conduct of foreign policy, it means that we are trying to promote initiatives, or the proponents of this approach are trying to promote initiatives in countries uh, like China, uh, or a number of other countries who, are, uh, who have an authoritarian uh, system. We are trying to promote practical results, be that in environmental protection or social rights uh, or other kinds of things. Basically, this approach accepts the idea of double standards because we, we see the world as being divided into value systems and we understand that the values of liberal democracy only apply to us, not to them. Um, now, the third um, model would be a value-based foreign policy of consciousness. This is inspired and based on uh, Václav Havel's uh, essay on uh, politics of consciousness. This was an essay he wrote as a speech in 1984, Politica Sviedomi. Um, and he couldn't deliver it himself because this was uh, delivered as a speech, as a thank you speech for a prize he was receiving in France. Instead of him, it was delivered by uh, Tom Stoppard. Um, what he does in that speech, and I really recommend you to read that, it's an 11-page document. Um, what he tells us there, he alerts us to the dangers of overt belief in the rationalizing forces um, of rationality, of the orthodoxy of rationality. Um, the danger of modernity and rationalization there uh, in the communist societies isn't the, isn't, isn't the only kind of danger, uh, or this danger isn't only in the communist societies for him. This sort of a danger is there in any modern society, including the Western societies. It is only more extreme in the communist societies. Um, so what happens in these, due to these rationalizing forces, due to the orthodoxy of rationality, uh, what you're losing is the a basic sense of humanity, of a human scale of the world, of a local human scale, where you can tell the right from the wrong. This is what he argues. So the, so the value-based foreign policy of consciousness would be, a form, would be a policy that would support local alternative ways of living in societies around the world. It's a kind of a micro-level approach. Um, where you would support all sorts of alternative versions of reality and existence. Is this too philosophical? Well, it might sound so, but in, but in fact, there are practical, very practical approaches that you can 
divide, derived from this. There are at least four very practical principles of foreign policy conduct. One, if you do value-based foreign policy based on this approach, you would be supporting groups within societies, attempting for alternative forms of existence, be that Falun Gong in China or LGBTQ movements in Russia. Um, secondly, you would support uh, groups um, and individuals in societies um, who seek alternative visions of life and existence for their society. So be that uh, people in Belarus or movements in Belarus who seek a European uh, future, uh, EU membership for Belarus, or other kinds of, uh, or other kinds of uh, uh, futures. There is basically no determinism in where you are based, that is the idea. And that, of course, also then relates to the third aspect, third practical aspect, that from this perspective there are no spheres or zones of influence, no natural geopolitical zones of influence. Uh, basically, this is a very anti-geopolitical approach based on Masaryk's uh, ideas, uh, which basically say that um, you can have it, it doesn't really matter where you are based geopolitically, you always have a choice for your society. And then, of course, number four, and that will be the fourth one, there are no double standards in this sort of an approach because you do expect the same things from your own society as you do expect from the others. So the basic ontology of this approach is that the world society is one entity and there are various versions of existence and various kinds of orders which enable you to make sure that people have a right to have alternative existence. Um, so that's just uh, these three models. Uh, I was shown that uh, one minute was gone about two minutes ago, so I'll have to stop, but I'm willing and happy to uh, discuss it. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm sure there will be more people after this speech uh, who will uh, look at this essay of Gavel. Uh, at least uh, this will be the result. And we get to uh, the second speaker on the panel, uh, Sharka Kolmashova, Deputy Head of the Department of International Relations and European Studies, Metropolitan University, Prague, uh, with the topic implementation of uh, responsibility to protect in the cases of Libya and Syria, a uh, kind of fashionable issue in international relations, please. Thank you, good afternoon. So I will skip all the introductions and use the 10 minutes as, as much as I can. And I will speak about the concept of the responsibility to protect. Further, I will use the um, acronym R2P. Uh, the concept of R2P has been recently criticized for the gap between words and deeds, particularly due to the insufficient international response to the crisis in Syria. So the question is, does, does it mean, does the case of Syria and the failure mean the end of the R2P as a norm, or more importantly, does it reflect an emergence of post-liberal global order? that would kind of link my contribution, my paper, to the more general topic of, of the conference, of the session. So I will argue that the particular crisis does not actually bring any fundamental change, and it rather reflects the pragmatic revisionism that started to emerge and that was emerging since the R2P concept was introduced back in 2001, so around the millennium. And therefore, the inconsistent implementation in Libya and Syria that is very fashionable, as, as was already mentioned and um, often commented, it's corresponding with the compromised nature of the R2P concept and also with the wider pragmatic global order. And it's reflected by the accommodation of moral principles according to political practices rather than simply implementing them. Firstly, I will briefly comment on the emergence of the R2P concept and I will demonstrate the false premise of its liberal universalist nature. Secondly, I will explain what is meant by pragmatic revisionism and in global ethics and how is it reflected by the R2P conception. And I will use the case of um, Libya and Syria. 
Finally, and very briefly, I will comment on the position of the Czech Republic to the R2P um, to demonstrate this pragmatic revisionism turn on a national level. So, very briefly, the debate on humanitarian intervention that was ongoing in the 1990s um, can be summed up as a clash of um, liberal universalism and realist power politics and the debate did not result in the victory of liberal values as the R2P conception on the first side might indicate. It was rather the conflicting norms and the compromise between these conflicting norms, namely the um, liberal and universalist protection of human rights on one hand and the inviolable um, state sovereignty on the, on the other hand, that were, as I said, clashing and competing, resulted in the adoption of a kind of compromise that was shaped within the R2P conception. And more importantly, the debate wasn't only um, taking place in abstract terms, it was rather shaped by practical situations, practical crisis situations that were taking place during the 90s. And two crisis situations were particularly important. It was the 1994 um, genocide in Rwanda and the insufficient international reaction to that. And secondly, the 1999 NATO intervention in Kosovo. And these two crisis situations led the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty to draft the R2P report, which responded to two particular problems or issues. The first one was the lack of political will, that was the model of Rwanda, and the lack of political consensus, that, that would be the, the model of Kosovo. And the R2P as it was um, adopted and then later on discussed during the 2005 World Summit and as it was slowly translated as, as let's say, a, a political concept that would be used even within the United Nations, it became more and more compromised and I would say resulted in a very, let's say, pragmatic and, and I would say flexible framework that Mm, legitimizes actually both intervention as well as inaction. And uh, I will use the concept of moral pragmatism, mm, which mm, to, to define it, I would reference to Todd Leakin and his excellent work, Making Morality from 2003, where he defines the, the essential building blocks of this um, philosophical approach. He argues that um, moral norms shouldn't be understood in, deontolo in deontological or, let's say, transcendental way, but rather as constituted by social practices, by practical policy making, and thus they are subject to inconsistent implementation and constant revisionism. And this can be very well reflected within the implementation of the R2P and, and the contemporary approach to that. In 2001, when the UN Security Council authorized um, the resolution to protect citizens and to, um, out, to use all necessary means to protect um, civilians in Libya, and then the NATO responded by military intervention, it seemed to be as a triumph of the R2P conception. And the combination of um, multilateral approval together with regional support provided the hallmark of legitimacy. However, the second and more careful look at, at the case shows that the, the optimism was, let's say, too, too rush. And that even the consensus was not that strong as it seemed to be. Some criticized the intervention as a misuse of the concept, overstretching the, the mandate that was given by the UN Security Council. And even the proponents of the, the intervention as well as the uh, R2P norm argued that it was rather an exception, exceptional case. 
And then even neither in the NATO there was such a unity as the title of the intervention unified protector would assume. The most, most striking was the position of Germany, which firstly abstained from the UN Security Council um, approval, abstained during the decision making, and then insisted on this engagement of Bundeswehr in, in, the, in the intervention. Then finally, the effectiveness was the, the issue and big problem, especially from the longer term time horizon. Looking at the situation in Libya now and calling it a success story would be, um, would be cynical. Yet the proponents of the R2P concept argue that finally the, the words were translated in deeds and the, the conception was implemented and it should be even a role model for, for future. Surprisingly, they reflected optimism even uh, in response to the crisis in Syria. On one side, if we compare it to Libya, it could be assessed as a manifest failure to use the language of the R2P framework, both of Assad's regime and the international community. And despite the fact that the scale of violence was even more alarming than in, in Libya, the lack of political consensus prevents use of military enforcement measures. However, the reflection with regard to R2P is still positive. For instance, Thomas G. Weiss argued that occasional action is better than no action, or Garrett Evans argued that lessons learned are more important than the failure itself. So these arguments will be probably presented even more loudly in the future, and they precisely show that the inconsistent implementation does not mean the failure or the, the does not reflect the limitations of the R2P concept, it is rather perceived as a trigger for future debate and for eventually for conceptual revision. So the pragmatic approach of occasional no to extreme violence quite sharply contrasts with the resolute never again that was um, resonating during the, the 90s. So far, I have argued that global politics is governed by moral pragmatism indicated by this revisionist approach towards the R2P norm. And finally, and very briefly, I will reflect on the pragmatism term on the national level, namely through the position of the Czech Republic towards the R2P. On a conceptual level, the pragmatic approach towards human rights protection has been reflected by the new 2015 conception of human rights and transition politics. Despite the fact that the Czech Republic um, proclaimed its support towards R2P on various multilateral platforms and repeatedly expressed its support to R2P, the conception doesn't mention the, the principles once. While introducing the fundamental principles, coherence, credibility, and openness, it declares the flexible approach towards implementing concrete measures according to the changing world politics. So it openly declares this flexibility and, and pragmatism, which, let's say, means to correspond to, to the selective and case-by-case implementation of, of global ethics. Really finally, on practical level, the Czech Republic neither did actively participate in the NATO intervention, nor it supports any military enforcement solution to the Syrian crisis. So in, in both cases, the Czech re representatives condemned the violence, yet they were rather reserved in terms of um, using military measures. And compared to the proactive liberalism the country promoted during the 90s, the contemporary foreign policy in the field of human rights is very reserved. Finally, in my point of view, it corresponds with the ongoing global revisionism in the field of human rights protection. Thank you for attention, and I will be pleased to answer your questions later on. Thank you. I hope this presentation will uh, make people ask a lot of questions. And now we go to the next one.
which is um, uh, kind of prepared by two people. Um, I uh, suppose that one will be speaking, and uh, the other one will probably help uh, uh, the speaker uh, during the question and answer period. Uh, so the speaker will be Thomas Weiss, uh, a head of Department of West European Studies, Faculty of Social Sciences, Charles University in Prague. And uh, he's helped by uh, Helena Schulzova, um, a researcher at the European uh, Institute for European Policy. Uh, and the presentation has an intriguing title, Unconventional Diplomatic Representation, Typology and Practice. So what's unconventional? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I <clears throat> can't do but, but uh, give some initial remarks, unfortunately. First, uh, it's turbulent times, so I'm not the head of Department of West European Studies, but head of Department of European Studies, and Helena doesn't work for Europeum anymore. Uh, and to add to that, uh, the paper was actually written by myself, Helena, and Mats Brown, who unfortunately couldn't be here uh, from the Metropolitan University, and draws heavily on two, research, two studies, uh, two pieces of research that we conducted uh, for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, and one of them was co-authored by Martina Rubeshkova, uh, who currently actually works somewhere in this building, uh, but couldn't be here either. And she bears no responsibility for, that, for this paper and for, for, for what I'm going to, to talk about. Uh, what I want to do <clears throat> is uh, to talk about unconventional diplomatic representations uh, and give you some kind of a proposal of a typology uh, and discuss a bit advantages and disadvantages in practice. Now, why this is relevant for this audience, uh, we basically asked what innovations are being introduced into diplomatic services of small and middle-sized EU member states. So there's the hint, small and middle-sized EU member states. Uh, we do not ask that much uh, how that works in bigger member states because we argue uh, that, uh, that the pressures uh, that, that work uh, against and on the diplomatic services of small and middle-sized member states are much bigger uh, than, the pressures, uh, than the pressures influencing the, the diplomatic services of bigger or big member states, uh, and, and therefore it, it will be much better visible uh, what the change actually consists of. So how can these uh, changes be conceptualized, how are they used in practice, uh, and how can these changes be interpreted? We had three points of departure, uh, the challenges and opportunities for, for a change in diplomatic representation. Uh, one of them is different needs, uh, especially within the EU, it has been argued by many uh, that the traditional diplomacy is kind of out of place uh, at the moment because there are direct contacts between, between the ministries, even between individual desk officers. Uh, so there is no need to have a residential embassy in another EU member state uh, because there's basically no business left for such an embassy. Uh, second, budgetary pressures. Uh, we have all heard and felt and lived through many austerity measures uh, in the past few years, and obviously diplomacy, uh, diplomatic services are no, uh, no, no exception. I would even argue that in, that in some member, EU member states, especially in this region, the foreign policy would be the first one when you basically cut the budget, because uh, the politicians uh, apparently uh, do not see need to have a foreign policy, and they do, they do not understand what foreign policy is for. Uh, and third, and this is a more general uh, trend, there are new technologies in influencing the practice of, of diplomacy and of representing a state abroad. Uh, obviously, much more, uh, many more people travel. We have heard that in, uh, in the morning or before the lunch. Uh, there are better means for information collection. Why should you have a, di a costly diplomat reading newspapers in place when you can read the news newspapers uh, in the internet? Uh, and obviously, communication means you do not need the diplomat to deliver your messages when you can just pick up the phone and call. So what what debate do we want to contribute with? And I should have said that uh, there is a paper written that I'm basically presenting here. It is currently uh, under peer review, and I hope that soon you will be able to read it in full. Uh, 
so I will go very quickly through that and, and highlight just, just, the, uh, just what I think should be highlighted. First, obviously, theory and practice of diplomacy, and second, instruments of EU member states' foreign policy, uh, because we, uh, we focused on EU member states and how they conduct their foreign, respective foreign policies. What contribution? Uh, we suggest or we propose a typology of new forms of representation uh, in a form of ideal types. Uh, so basically you will probably see uh, many overlaps between them, but we try to define, uh, define these types against each other uh, and define ideal types that probably never really and uh, nowhere really exist in the, in the real world. I will get to that later. Uh, we've gathered empirical material on eight EU member states' diplomatic reforms. Uh, you can see there uh, in the PowerPoint the, uh, wh uh, what states these were. Uh, we have conducted altogether 43 interviews with practitioners in these states and of from these states between uh, 2011 and 2013. Uh, and we have tried or we have identified uh, practical consequences of, of these innovations in the diplomatic services. Now, these are our four ideal types. <clears throat> First, co-location, and I will get to, that, uh, to, to those types uh, in more detail later. Uh, second, regionalization. Third, mini embassies. And fourth, roving ambassadors. Now, what, what, what are they? Uh, I'm not going to give you uh, the full definitions. They are mostly uh, kind of two or three sentences long, so I, I don't want to bother you with that. Uh, and I just refer to the paper, which hopefully will be published sooner or later, somewhere, once. Uh, co-location. Uh, co-location is basically sharing between states. Uh, this sharing can, can be purely physical in terms of sharing a venue, uh, sharing a building, having basically two embassies within one building, or it even can be functional uh, in terms of sharing some functions. Uh, well, the easiest way would probably be sharing the reception desk. Uh, in, in, the, in the common building, uh, but there are cases of sharing a diplomat, for example, a two member states or two states uh, sharing one single diplomat reporting to both countries uh, and the costs on that diplomat being, uh, being uh, shared by the, by the two states. And obviously there can be, sh there, there can be co-location with other states and with other states' diplomatic services or with other services within one state uh, within one state, or even with some kind of different service, such as the European External Action Service, for example. Advantage, advantages are clear, savings mainly, but in some cases, particularly uh, in the case of Nordic countries or in Visegrad, uh, you can see that, that the co-location may serve a public diplomacy purpose, uh, because basically the countries present themselves as a, as a, as a part of the bloc. So not only they, sh they share the costs, but they also present themselves of, as being Visegrad states or Nordic states. Uh, a kind of nice example where the, uh, where the sh sh savings were probably not that high are the Nordic embassies in, in Berlin. Obviously, there are many problems. It is pretty difficult to negotiate the sharing between the services. There is some competition, uh, in particular, if you have economic diplomacy attached to the, uh, to the representation, and you, pro and you might have uh, some, uh, some competition between the two countries that would otherwise uh, be able to share. Uh, the same can be said about public diplomacy, uh, because obviously the uh, representation abroad serves also the purpose of presenting the country abroad and making it distinct from the others, uh, which goes exactly against what I said before as an advantage, uh, being presenting yourself not as distinct from the others, but being part of a block. Uh, and it is very difficult to set up and maintain and requires constant negotiations. Which brings me to the second one, which is regionalization. Uh, that is easier in terms of being just within one system. Uh, there are many forms of, or many types of regionalization, but basically what that means is sharing either, uh, either coverage of the, of the embassy or, uh, or some functions within a, bro uh, within a region. Uh, so there are regional embassies, which you all know that, that is the very traditional one, that you have uh, the, uh, an embassy in one country that uh, somehow serves 
and other countries in that particular region. Uh, there is a hub and spoke uh, model which you, where you have a big embassy in one country and then smaller embassies around in the, in the uh, adjacent countries or even regional support centers uh, which the Dutch have, uh, have uh, introduced with quite some success uh, where you basically concentrate some functions uh, in geographically even distant areas such as accountancy for example. Advantages, again, obviously savings. It allows, re it allows a representation in more countries, uh, especially, for example, the hub and spoke model, uh, where you have one big embassy and then, but you can be presented in, in uh, you can be present in other countries in the form of smaller embassies that are supported from the regional hub. Uh, and it increases flexibility because you can open up very quickly uh, a, smaller, a smaller representation. It requires, at the same time, flexible network and flexible individuals uh, that are able to work not within one single office but with, uh, within the system. Uh, and there might be some potential institutional resistance if it, uh, if it ends up with cutting down jobs in diplomacy. Mini embassies. Uh, this is, in a way, a traditional embassy, but a very, very tiny. Uh, so an embassy which doesn't have many diplomats, dozens of diplomats working uh, in the office, it can be an embassy which basically has only one or two diplomats uh, and then is supported uh, by, uh, uh, by some local, uh, local hirings. Advantage, obvious, again, cheaper. You rely on the locally hired stuff. Uh, and the locals, at the same time, they are cheaper and they bring, uh, bring in networks and knowledge and continuity because they stay. Uh, and it allows representation in more countries. The problems, it cannot offer all the services and there are some legal limitations uh, to, the, to this system. Roving ambassadors uh, or flying ambassadors as they are sometimes being called uh, is basically no permanent representation. This is a permanent ambassador who is not stationed in the host country but is stationed at the, at the, at the ministry in the capital. <coughs> Uh, there are few advantages, and I, I'm running out of time, so I'm not reading those out loud. You can read that by yourself. Uh, this is, again, kind of cheaper. You don't have the office, uh, but the disadvantage is exactly that you do not have the office. Right? So all the rest is, is uh, in a way, uh, connected to those, uh, to those two. So I will go to the conclusions directly. Now, these four ideal types or types that we've defined, and some of them ob obviously overlap because many embassies, as an example, are ideal to, uh, to be part of this hub and spoke regionalization of the system, for example. Uh, they are different, they differ from each other, uh, but at the same time they have many similarities in practical advantages and disadvantages. First, they increase cost, eff cost effectiveness, uh, they are cheaper, uh, but at the same time uh, they offer limited services. Many of them rely on limiting the services that a traditional full-fledged embassy offers. They increase and at the same time rely on uh, flexibility of the network and of the diplomats. It is simply not the traditional work that everybody is used to. Uh, it is necessary to be more flexible while working in this system. There are many obstacles within the system which can be overcome, for example, legal, accountancy related and so on, but some of the, of the obstacles are not, are in a way up, out, from outside of the system, beyond the system, such as security, uh, security uh, considerations or political sensitivity of changing the representation in the host country. Uh, so that means, or that's our uh, conclusion, uh, that these alternative types of representation cannot really substitute the traditional embassy completely in the system. They can just be an, ad uh, an adjustment of the system. And what is kind of intriguing and interesting, the countries that have introduced some of the alternative systems, and we have investigated only in the EU countries, in a way introduced these changes both within and outside the EU system. So uh, whether the host country is an EU member or not, uh, kind of against our expectations, did not change the behavior of the country, uh, countries. They either, either introduced the change or not. And finally, what is the impact on the practice of diplomacy? Uh, first, it changes the perception of diplomacy. Uh, there is a, 
a distinct shift from, uh, represent, uh, from diplomacy being representation to diplomacy being task-solving uh, body. Uh, but at the same time, uh, some, of the, some of the changes can actually uh, allow being uh, the country being represented in more places in the world. And our final conclusion, and most important probably, and more, most preliminary one, is the fact that we argue that this, these changes require diplomats professionals. And in a way, they raise the entry costs, uh, of, uh, the costs of entry into diplomacy. Uh, it is simply, if the system has got these changes introduced, it is simply not as easy as it was before uh, to be parachuted into diplomacy uh, from other, uh, other types of uh, societal work, such as soldiers, former politicians, and so on. Because it basically requires that the diplomats are really professionals, uh, they do not have the stuff that they could rely on. Uh, so basically, we can see that the systems that do introduce these changes uh, are, uh, need to be highly professional, uh, more professionalized, uh, and the entry costs are simply higher. Thank you very much. Sorry for being a bit uh, too long. And yeah. uh, we're really looking forward to uh, having your questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you. It's uh, in everybody's interest just to leave uh, time for questions. As you understand, each presentation is uh, just a glimpse in topics that could constitute a series of lectures. So we um, never have enough time. Uh, and now we get to our next speaker, uh, Jan uh, Ruzicka, uh, lecturer in security studies uh, at the Department of International Politics in Aberyst with uh, University. I'm not sure that I pronounced it correctly, but I, I'm quite sure that this is the university where the first chair for international relations was opened once upon a time. Uh, and uh, uh, he has a, a presentation on nuclear weapons, non-proliferation, and global order. Please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, you did quite well. It's pronounced Abristwis, and uh, outsiders usually struggle. It's a Welsh name. And it is indeed the first department in the world in international politics. And, Turn the mic. Oh, and um, it was uh, established to uh, mind and build up global order, indeed. Now, I was given 10 minutes to talk on nuclear weapons and uh, the current global order, so here goes. Uh, it seems to me that I ought to start with two fundamental assumptions. Nuclear weapons have two implications for the global order. One is they are a stabilizing factor. Nuclear weapons have been fundamental in calming great power rivalries because they provide fundamental ontological security for great powers. No longer do you need to balance to maintain your own security. I realize this might be controversial a, a little bit, but uh, that's the first assumption I'm going to make. The other assumption is that, of course, nuclear weapons have a great potential to upset the global order. This takes two forms. One is, of course, the destructive power. So as much as nuclear weapons... Turn the mic towards you. As much as nuclear weapons might have uh, calmed great power rivalries, they of course possess a destructive power of such a magnitude that uh, the global order might vanish if they were indeed used. The other form in which uh, there is a potential to upset the current global order, of course, is defiant. A state that possesses nuclear weapons will be able to, to defy other states. Now, the most extreme example of this probably would be North Korea, but you can surely think of other examples. So we've got two implications of the existence here that are quite fundamental, right? Stabilization and the potential for great destruction and the upset of the order. Now, this creates an imperative for the maintenance of order. How does one deal with this thing, the question of nuclear weapons? Now, we've seen, of course, a very obvious way how to manage the problem, and through a cooperative arrangement, like the Non-Proliferation Treaty, but other treaties that broadly produce what's called the Non-Proliferation Regime, 
there has been an attempt to stem the spread of nuclear weapons and to basically await the worst, i.e. the potential to destroy the global order. The other way in which this problem or question has been managed, of course, is the enforcement of rules. And so we've seen what might be called the wars of non-proliferation. We've seen attempts to coerce and to arm twist states into not doing things that others might think dangerous. Once again, in the name of protecting the global order. The basic justification of, of these two measures, the cooperative and enforcement measures, of course, has been the belief that this works. In other words, uh, contrary to the long-running worries about the doom and gloom of the spread of nuclear weapons, it's been relatively limited, and we've seen no nuclear war as of yet, or rather wars where nuclear weapons would have been used. So there is clearly a pragmatic argument behind this. Now, I would argue that also what makes this work are the following three things that are rather less uh, nice. And that's inequality, injustice, and hypocrisy. Now, granted, every order will include these. Inequality, injustice, and hypocrisy. In fact, the pragmatic justification that the current regime works sometimes admits to this. So there's a famous book by Joseph Nye uh, on nuclear ethics, which says that basically, yes, indeed, the non-proliferation regime is not just, and it might deal in hypocrisies, but it works. It provides stability. Now, that is, of course, true, and that's a powerful argument, but so long as there are defections from such an order, there are going to be problems. As states defect or attempt to defect, this creates what I would call is the non-proliferation imperative, i.e. the spread of nuclear weapons must be prevented, either by diplomatic means and coercion, or by force. Otherwise, the regime would, of course, face a breakdown. Now, there is, of course, a paradox here at play that will be easy for you to discern. Such measures to maintain the order contain the seed of the order's own destruction. So as long as smaller or medium-sized states will see that without the possession of nuclear weapons, they are really open to harm, extortion, and threats. They will at least consider the possibility unless they are aligned and allied with states that might provide nuclear umbrella and protection. Now, not every state will find itself in such a position. So we're dealing with a situation where there is a problem of nuclear weapons that is somehow being solved as is, but really the regime is only concerned with the question of stability, not with the question of how to deal with nuclear weapons. So what is to be done? Why does this matter? And those will be my last two points, because I will stick to my 10 minutes. Now on the one hand, I think a clear-cut analysis of what is going on is not a call to say that this has been entirely unsuccessful. In fact, if you're on the right side in the current regime, as m most or vast majority indeed of states are, it works for you, and that's great. But of course, it only takes one or two or few for the breakdown to happen, and the implications of the breakdown would be great. So an analysis like this one, I think, has got the two conclusions. One is that we should be really worried or concerned about feel-good initiatives like the humanitarian initiative. Now, I realize this might be provocative, but they really only work for those states that are already status quo powers or status quo states. 
The other implication, of course, is that we probably might want to think about the question of nuclear weapons differently. So if we're really concerned about the nuclear weapons, we ought not to think in terms of stability. Now, that's somewhat absurd and controversial. But probably what really con creates the problem of nuclear weapons is the structural environment in which we're dealing. And that's the structural environment of the state system. So you might go two ways here. One is, of course, that you will adopt the Waltzian laissez-faire position and you let everyone have nuclear weapons because this will have a stabilizing and calming influence. The dangers and problems with this position are notoriously known. The chief among them, of course, is the inadvertent escalation and nuclear war. But it is an important position. The other one, of course, has long been expounded by a number of people, especially in the 1940s and 50s, and it's the idea of the world government. Now, we no longer talk about the world government because it's deemed to be impossible. And clearly, it is a difficult question. It is almost inconceivable or entirely inconceivable because it is impractical. No one would ever do this. But I would like to conclude on the following thought. In early modern period in Europe, of course, the problem of violence and harm was just as pervasive. And it was hard for all the actors to imagine and conceive that one day they would live in what we now tend to think of the leviathans of sovereign states. So maybe we might want to engage our political imagination a little bit more and think about alternative structural arrangements. Thank you very much. Thank you. Th thank you for perfect timing. And we have the last speaker on the panel, uh, Rudolf Furst, a researcher in our host institute, the Institute of International Relations in Prague, uh, with the topic Sino European Modern Open Partnership. Modern is uh, in quotation marks, uh, yeah. so it's probably not that modern as open. Or, yeah. I, I well, you will that. tell us. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Good afternoon to, to all of you. Uh, my paper is focused on Sino-European relations, but I, I would like to, to divide it in three points. At first, I would, I would like to mention the changing narrative of uh, Chinese foreign policy. Secondly, I would like to, to focus on the new uh, go West strategy and the, the new concept of uh, Silk Road diplomacy. And finally, I would, I would uh, uh, end with with uh, comment what's what's in it for Europe and for Sino-European strategic partnership. In the title, I, I, I use the term of a modern open relationship uh, or partnership because I was to I, I wanted to adopt the, the, this uh, love style uh, talking, which which appeared in uh, in the beginning of a previous. Uh, uh, decade when the when the Beijing Brussels axis was becoming to uh, um, highlighted in, in uh, the media and in scholarly uh, articles. One of the first authors who, who defined this uh, new, uh, er, new uh, uh, diver divergence and surprising divergence was Professor David Chembo, uh, well-known uh, liberal um, American scholar who, who, is, who is dealing with the Chinese affairs. So at first, let, let me to, to begin with, uh, with the changing uh, uh, narrative of Chinese foreign policy. Uh, uh, um, recently, Chinese were a Chinese, a Chinese uh, uh, foreign policy uh, narrative was following the uh, old uh, concept of co uh, communist regime, which was which was called as a law uh, law profile. In the Chinese, call it Taoguan Yanghui. This is this is the concept that China China uh, um, is focused on um, enlarging its uh, domestic potential. But in foreign policy, it, it hopes to 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 avoid. At, uh, attracting uh, uh, attention, especially negative uh, attention, especially from the uh, that time superpowers from Soviet Union and uh, from, from the United States. This uh, this smart uh, uh, diplomacy, uh, who, whose godfather was uh, Zhou Enlai, uh, was somehow changed in, in 1990s when the Chinese were promoting the, the style of uh, uh, peaceful rise of China. 
this eclectic, eclectic uh, narrative um, adopted the Western IT, uh, international relations theory um, f borrowed from the uh, liberal stream, which, which, which put stress on soft power, uh, economy first, and win-win uh, partnership, and uh, uh, um, inter in interdependence, and uh, the peaceful rise uh, means that there, are, there is no danger for uh, Asian neighbor countries, and, and that, that China is not hoping to challenge the uh, American uh, the dominance in uh, Asia Pacific. Maybe surprisingly, uh, Beijing uh, 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 stopped to follow this uh, this uh, uh, effective effective um, diplomatic uh, language, and recently was was uh, recently appeared the new new concept of uh, Silk Road di Silk Road uh, diplomacy. This Silk Road diplomacy is connected with the huge. Uh, uh, investment expansion, which happened uh, after, which happened since the beginning of, of this uh, century. If, if for someone it's the breaking point of a recent history, it's uh, uh, September 11. Maybe much greater, but less spectacular. It's the Chinese go global. China, China must increase its, sec its uh, access for resources. And China, have, China had to start expanding. So far, China was no, no relevant in investor. But now the uh, Chinese uh, investment activities, including in uh, uh, Africa, in Latin America, and uh, in the center, center Asia, uh, and in Western Europe, uh, actually elsewhere, was it was becoming a new, new, in interesting topic for uh, international relations. That's why I hope this uh, this topic belongs to the to the theme of uh, global order. China is new, maybe not much expect, uh, expected and not probably welcome, but China is a new top class global actor. Why the Chinese do it? Chinese people uh, hate traveling. Uh, Chinese people are uh, uh, self-centric. They, they, they prefer staying at home and not to change habits, uh, to, to keep on eating the same things and not to, not to spend money at random. You know, uh, they are uh, maybe conservative, not, not, not much open for new things, maybe just uh, watching TV or soccer, uh, uh, but not to travel far away. But still, Chinese have now they have traveled to Africa and to, to open up their businesses there, and and to the Chinese have to establish a, a strategic partnership with uh, with all the relevant actors. There is a strategic partnership between China and the USA, strategic partnership between uh, China and Russia, a strategic partnership be between um, China and uh, new Central um, Asian post-communist states, a strategic partnership with uh, European Union a strategic par partnership of, uh, of, with many other, other, other countries. I, excuse me, I have no, no time to, to present the whole list. <coughs> but <coughs> the Go West strategy has its logic, and actually it looks new, but it is not new. Uh, we, uh, if, we, if, we, um, if we observe the uh, previous decades, the China needs to develop its Western provinces, because there, are, uh, there is a great gap be be between the East Shore provinces and between the rest of the country and especially with, with the China's West, and there is a necessary to to build up the new new uh, uh, infrastructure and uh, uh, transportation connect connections between China and uh, Russia, Russian Siberia, and Central Asia, due to the na natural resources and all, all the pipelines that are being constructed there. So why should why why does China hope to, to enlarge this big scale project even farther to Eastern Europe? Because this is the new strategic idea. The Chinese Chinese uh, foreign policy it's it's interesting by many things. It's a special mixture of uh, realism and uh, conservative thinking. Many scholars point at the Chinese global economic activity, but the lack of Chinese global thinking. And this promoting or expanding this uh, uh, investments into the Central Asia are now being prolonged into, into the uh, Eastern Europe and, and end in the uh, Western Europe. Uh, 
So there's actually the concept of, of uh, ambitious project to, to connect all the all the regional structures that were uh, jointly were established by China. That means the China and Russian strategic partnership, China uh, and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is the uh, uh, regional organization. And altogether with format 16, 1 plus 16, uh, Czech Republic is, is a member of that, and connected with, with the format of uh, EU strategic partnership. So all these partly um, uh, regional projects are now connected together. If you if you uh, have a look at this at this map, uh, such a uh, global and transcontinental uh, project, it's it's uh, it's uh, displayed m many times. And if you submit the Silk Road on one belt one road to to Google search, you can you can find a similar but somehow. Uh, dif different pictures. So that means that this project is still not unfinished, that this is just a general goal, and this is a, uh, such a topic for uh, diplomatic uh, negotiations. But there are many substantial risks for such an, uh, a huge transcontinental uh, super network. Uh, it means uh, political instability, uh, changes of political regimes in Central Asia, in the in, in Middle East, um, financial, financial risk, security risk, one of the most serious, etc. So anyway, all the, all the partners who, who deal with China, they, they, they are uh, attracted by such an um, enormous and huge, huge project, but its real feasibility is still uh, not not clear, and it needs very careful scrutiny. And what's in it for the European Union? Well, the strategic partnership was launched in 2003, and the, there were great plans how to how to boost the Sino-European uh, cooperation. Uh, um, EU, it's it's a special uh, international actor because it's uh, actually. Uh, uh, it has n never been uh, taken seriously in China as a political, political organization, but its economic impact is enormous. China is, uh, uh, EU is a soft power superpower, so, and this is the largest economic partner for China, so this, this matters the most. So this is the basically the biggest argument. Well, the uh, strategic partnership between EU and China went through a series of mutual disappointments. So China failed to, to persuade uh, Brussels and the EU member countries to lift the arms embargo. China failed to, to get from EU the market economic status. EU uh, was disappointed about the poor human rights records and in China and no, no visible uh, positive uh, changes. Uh, EU has been uh, disappointed by by no greater uh, access to Chinese market. Uh, ch EU has been disappointed about the poor progress in increasing the, its um, investments in China, etc. So this is uh, the strategic partnership between uh, EU and, and China. It's, it continues, but it's still without, without the original, uh, let's say, affection or optimism, but this is still no, no, no reason to just to, to quit it. So that's why I, I call it as an uh, open, open relationship. That is, this is a mat more mature relationship that went through a series of mutual disappointment and which tolerates the uh, encounters of the partner with, with, with many, many other partners. I would like to conclude about the new uh, Chinese uh, diplomatic expansion, that it is ex increasing relevance of China continental go west strategy, because China is usually observed from the point of view of Asia Pacific. But usually the transcontinental uh, focus of Chinese foreign policy is, is under research. And this is for, for us, for Europeans, it's more interesting than, than other issues. And the One Belt, One World project, is, it does not mean automatically that there would be an axis China-Russia. 
the attitude of Russia, of Russia to, towards this uh, uh, trans, uh, trans um, uh, Eurasian uh, uh, big project is unclear. And what I would like to put stress is that I, I, that is increasing, uh, uh, increasing importance of post-communist Europe, not, not just the format uh, 16 countries that the Czech Republic is as a member, but also Ukraine, B Belarus and Moldova. And finally, I would, I would, uh, uh, I would end with, with, the, with uh, the economic, uh, the, the, eco the EU economic relevance is it's, uh, still for the Chinese policy, foreign policy, a uh, very important issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we still have around 15 minutes at best for questions, uh, so I think we will uh, gather a number of questions if uh, there are any, so please uh, raise your hands. I do understand that topics were so different and uh, uh, you probably have too many ideas to formulate a particular question, but I would ask you to still uh, concentrate on one of the topics and uh, try to, uh, uh, to ask your questions to one particular speaker uh, that uh, you want to hear the answer from. So please, your questions. Yeah, please. Is there a microphone somewhere? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Ah, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My name is Vladimir Handel. I'm from the Institute of International Relations and from the China... Uh, speak up a bit. <coughs> yeah, thanks. My name is Vladimir Handel. I'm from the Institute of International Relations and from the Charles University. I have a question to... Jana Kruzicka, uh, there was something missing at the end of your presentation. Uh, you talked about the status quo and then uh, alternatively about two, two other possible ways, I mean the laissez-faire less, less when everybody has, uh, everybody has its own uh, nuclear weapons or, uh, or the world, uh, world government. Uh, so where, what is your sort of, I, I didn't understand what is your sort of option or what is your solution to the to the to the to the uh, uh, to the problem of nuclear weapons and glo global world order. If you could uh, elaborate a bit on, on this, and then if I may, one question on uh, Rudolf. Uh, first on China, uh, you described very clearly the uh, dynamic of the change of Ch uh, of Chinese uh, strategy. My question would be: um, in this liberal phase of, of uh, Chinese foreign policy, mil military force and hard power was not extremely important, but not primarily important, it was really the economic diplomacy. Now, what is the role of hard power in the current Silk Road strategy, if you may? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, more questions? Yeah, please. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Teresa Novotna and I'm based at uh, University in Brussels, University of Libre de Bruxelles. I have two questions, if I may. One for uh, Tomasz and Helena. Uh, I'm really looking forward to reading your paper, um, but I was wondering about one, one aspect. I mean, I had a feeling that uh, your dis the division of, of uh, you know, the, the idol types and so on is based on quite um, utilitarian thinking from the, f f f in, in, you know, in, in terms of the, the countries uh, who choose mini embassies and so on. Um, did, you, did you see that these countries also think that, well, we, you know, we can have collocation because we actually want to create European foreign policy, for example? You know, is there something more than just being very practical and, and, and trying to save any money? And is there perhaps any division between um, I don't know, uh, Central and Eastern European states on one hand and Western countries on the other. And if I may, a uh, second question to Rudolf first on the, uh, on the EU's uh, strategic partnership with China. Um, and sort of you, you mentioned at one point that you think that China doesn't have really a big political strategy and that's, that's like one, one of the, the problems. Uh, I mean, in terms of the strategic partnership, isn't also the problem that um, you know the EU member states are quite happy to use it to their advantage so you know when when it comes to human rights I mean there was a uh, EU China human rights dialogue in, in December I think you know they are very happy to use it for that matter but when it comes to issues like trade suddenly you know the bilateral uh, bilateral links are much more important than the strategic <laughs> partnership so you know the, the EU strategic partnership with China suffers uh, because of the divisions 
among the member states. And in fact, you know, the 16, 16 plus one is, is, is quite a clear example where, you know, uh, the non-16 EU member states were very critical of it because it divides the EU on this matter. Thank you. Thank you. And there was uh, some, yeah, please. And, and this will be the last uh, question we can. Uh, okay. Uh, Michal Romans of Faculty of Social Sciences. I have only one question and it is uh, to, Rob, uh, to Rudolf first. I do agree with you that the Russian role within the Chinese strategy is unclear. Nevertheless, I would like to ask you, what do you think will be positive or negative role? Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I would add uh, one question from myself uh, to uh, Joseph Butler uh, the, the, on the first presentation. Um, you uh, spoke about this uh, uh, third concept of uh, value-based foreign policy of consciousness and supporting the uh, various minority groups, basically, inside societies. But doesn't this lead to more conflict, as it happens with uh, um, supporting Tibet in China, with uh, uh, supporting the LGBT groups? Uh, this produces even more pressure on them, or isn't it? And uh, please, uh, let's, uh, let's go from this side to, to, to this side, because we had uh, quite a number of questions on China. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your inter interesting uh, questions. Uh, as to the hard power in the Silk Road uh, strategy, uh, I think that uh, soft power diplomacy is, is uh, focused at, uh, at first on uh, soft power, especially during the uh, investment and uh, the trade uh, bid. But the hard power, it's, it's becoming uh, behind, but it, we, we, we cannot predict what happens because, because uh, if such an, uh, a strategic uh, transportation net network one exists and it goes through the Central Asia, there would be uh, d d a deluge of uh, occasional uh, 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 threats and, and so negotiating the, the sharing the hard power with, with local with local states it's it's one of the biggest mysteries for me you know so usually the the, Chin, the chinese uh, the chinese uh, diplomatic um, uh, narrative is full of win win and and, uh, and uh, soft power but scholars who who uh, who study the chinese soft power practices you, you usually point at including my my myself usually point at such such a, a kind of freudian slips that when the soft power doesn't doesn't work very well so hard power it's sometimes um, just good to use you know so this the, the future of this uh, of this project from the point of view of hard power it's it's very it's very uh, questionable yeah. it's it's a great topic i i, I believe as to the uh, eu uh, P prs uh, china um, uh, strategic partnerships there is a great problem with fragmentation of the agenda that's that's of course a big big weakness of of the eu because it's there is an actually very poor coherence small states like czech republic they may benefit from that for for example by by using the help of of eu partners for some some uh, um, for some uh, in, uh, trade trade disputes, because it would be very difficult for for the Czech capacity to to launch um, some um, arbitrary, you know, proceedings f against China, who is who is very assertive and, and very strong. But we, we can see that that the EU agenda uh, it's 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 splitting. Uh, G Germany typically it's it's the one of the core leaders of in, within the EU, but G Germany established its own strategic partnership, bilateral strategic partnerships, uh, but with China and Berlin it's now doing his his own policy so so the um, top level political exchange and um, and, uh, and uh, economic cooperation it's it's very it's very active and and, and the other member states in EU are 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 dragging behind that's true and the, the Russian role in the in the in the build up of the strategic uh, strategic uh, uh, network and this is i think it would be pragmatic it belongs on the 
impact on the situation and how far the, the Chinese economic muscles would, would matter. I, I, I would be more surprised that, that, that there would be some polit political coordination. I, I, believe, I, I, would, I would bet on the, on the pressure or, or through the economic ch Chinese economic channels. But I, I'm, not, I, I'm not expert on Russian affairs, so for me it's quite a difficult question. Thank you. Uh, Jan? Uh, thank you for the question, Vladimir. Uh, I thought I was reasonably clear that I thought that uh, there, the, the solution, in my view, lies in a different uh, political arrangement, right? So the way towards the world government. Now, clearly, that is not going to happen anytime soon, but at least political imagination needs to be exercised in that direction. I don't think there is any other way. The status quo is a variation on the laissez-faire principle, and it's bound to go boom at some point. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we go to Josef. All right. Uh, thanks for that question, Sergey. Now, the, the question, of course, is about uh, whether support to alternative visions of life and alternative lifestyles uh, would be increasing the chances of conflict. And, and of course, I mean, if there are societies which do not tolerate um, alternative styles of life, um, we need to try and there are, of course, basic human rights which uh, deserve protection. Now, of course, this is not unlimited. So if there would be groups that would be uh, endangering other groups uh, in terms of breaking the law uh, or endangering their lives. That, of course, is the limit of where you actually do not, shouldn't, shouldn't really support um, alternative visions of life. Now I'm speaking about fundamentalists, terrorists, and those kinds of things. That's not where you go. But if there are Tibetans who want to uh, live their lives with a consciousness of being Tibetan, that I think should be encouraged even though there would be more conflict. Thank you. Uh, Thomas and Helena. Uh, I'll take over that. Tomáš may say, add something afterwards. <laughs> um, to a large degree, it is utilitarian, but it's, um, the reforms are utilitarian at, at this moment, but that's given by the circumstances predominantly. Um, if there are any tries to sort of form some, some common uh, foreign policy that would be in countries that are very closely cooperating and where even before. Um, and the question if there is some east-west divide, yes there is, but it's probably not in the motivation, but it's more in the expectation of the, of the domestic audience or, or voters generally. Um, where uh, we, we really figure out, figured out there's a clear line between what, uh, say, Czech citizen expects from his embassy compared to, to an average Dutch citizen. And uh, this is very much reflected also in the policies uh, of their given countries. Um, yeah, also, of course, there is a massive difference between uh, red tape and the bureaucratic burden that it's uh, much heavier um, in the former uh, Austrian-Hungarian Empire. We, we really found very similar patterns uh, in Austria and Slovakia and the Czech Republic. Uh, though, for example, even Sweden um, has some issues with that, and we were even surprised by um, how inflexible sometimes um, the administrations can be and, and really how how much how miserable they can make the life of, of some diplomats because they really have to improvise. So I guess that's it for me. Maybe very short, uh, shortly to the European foreign policy emerging. Uh, I mean, you know better than we do, I guess, on that. Uh, my reading is that the countries that in principle support in the long term a creation of EU foreign policy have no problem with that. I doubt it, that would be the first and foremost impulse to, to collocate, for example, to collocate with the EAS just in order to promote EU foreign policy. Rather, they are more open to collocation with the EAS because they simply do not, uh, they are not reserved to in future to have a uh, foreign pol EU foreign policy. But at the same time, and you know better than we do, they are structural obstacles to that that are imposed on these states that are in principle optimistic by those states that are in principle very pessimistic about the EAS in general and, and the creation of EU foreign policy, uh, which, is, uh, which is somehow 
introduced into the system by making it legally very difficult for even those states that are open to it to collocate with the EAS. Uh, so uh, at, at the moment, I don't see a real, that, that, that the creation of EU foreign policy would be anyhow a factor in the decision making. It might in the end, in a few decades more, more rather than earlier, uh, help create an EU foreign policy, but, but not really at the moment. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, so we uh, had actually uh, all questions answered and uh, we run out of time. So I uh, suggest that we thank the panelists of this uh, long panel.